Well, good morning, congregation. I'd like to uh, welcome you in the name of our risen Lord Jesus Christ to our 2020 Easter service, our resurrection service. Uh, Christ the Lord is risen indeed. Uh, he is so, uh, indeed, it goes without saying. Uh, I know there's a tradition that we uh, go by that where I say, Christ is risen, and then you answer, he, indeed he is, but it goes without saying that he is, so we don't need to do that this morning. Well, on behalf of uh, Autumn and uh, Brenda and Kathy, and we have a couple sound uh, technicians, Randy and Dan, at the back there, uh, we, uh, we miss you, and uh, we'd love to worship together, but we are worshiping together. Um, so let's begin with our call to worship, and uh, this is responsive reading, and I will begin. Uh, it is true, Christ Jesus lives. He is risen from the dead. The greatest, the greatest foe has, has been, been overcome. overcome. Christ, Christ is risen. The journey through the darkness is over. This brilliant light of this morning floods our hearts and spirits. Jesus lives. Jesus lives forever. He lives he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Receive God's greetings. Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God the Father, through His Son, Jesus Christ, and in communion with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our opening song is Christ the Lord is Risen Today. Christ the Lord is Risen Today. Let's come to our Lord in prayer, shall we pray? This morning, Lord, we confess that we are fearful because we live in the grip of death. Our lives do not go on forever. There are limits to what we know 
limitations upon what we can do in our world, amidst sickness and disease and tragedy, we learn the power of death amongst us. And Lord, in our worship today, give us faith in your resurrection victory. Help us to see your light at the end of our tunnels. Convince us of the surety of your final resurrection victory so that we might live our lives with confidence, with boldness, and with a sure sense of where we're headed. As in our beginning, so in our end, it is your presence always with us that counts. And in your name we pray. Amen. We have not been able to gather here in the sanctuary for our Lenten series, and if things went the way we were hoping, we would be, uh, as we went through Lent, having all these candles lit, and then one by one to darkness. Well, we travel from Good Friday, which is darkness, from Golgotha, from the cross, and all the lights are out. Easter Sunday, we will light the Christ candle, Christ is the light of the world. So we will go through a, a litany here, and I will begin, and Autumn and Kathy will help me out in it. Christ, you are the light of the world. The true light which enlightens everyone. But we confess that at times we try to hide the light within us. Sometimes we don't stand up for what is right, and sometimes we knowingly do wrong. Forgive us for the times we don't let your light shine through us. Christ, in this dark world, help us to shine your light everywhere we go. Help us to be witness for you. So that through all our actions we proclaim, Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Let's sing, Up from the Grave He Arose.
to read a couple passages for our sermon, for our message. And the first one is from Matthew chapter 27, verse 62. Matthew chapter 27, verse 62. And then the next one is from Acts 5. And uh, just notice that here we have um, some authorities, some leaders, and you can just notice how anxious they are with the resurrection and the events uh, pertaining to the cross. Matthew 27, verse 62. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, the deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been risen from the dead. This last deception or hoax will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard. I would also like us to read... Again, you see the leaders scrambling here. Acts chapter 5, verse 17. Acts 5, 17 to 20, then I'm going to jump forward. Then the high priest and all the associates, this is uh, after the resurrection. Then the high priest and all his associates were members of the party of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, he said to the apostles, stand in the temple courts and tell the people the full message of this new life, referring to the resurrection. Uh, That's exactly what they did, and uh, they once again got arrested. Then further down, it reads this way, Having brought the apostles, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. He gave you, we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. And Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you have killed by hanging him on a tree. So thus far, the reading of God's word. We weren't standing all that close, said the disciples. But from what we could see, it didn't look good. Yes, he was dead. Well, obviously a shock to the system. What transpired transpired on that fateful Friday so long ago was not at all what they had expected. In their wildest dreams, they did not prepare themselves for that gruesome sight of their breathless master and friend, Jesus, his body dangling there from the cross right before their very eyes. Did this mean that while it was a wonderful ride for three years or so, now life would quietly go back to normal? Yes, Uh, Death is difficult to deal with. It always is. But at least we know how to deal with it. And they, these followers, these disciples, would learn as well, and eventually in time, rest assured, life would go back to normal, even for these early struggling followers. Or would life ever go back to normal? Yes, it's Friday, but they don't know Sundays are coming. You and I know that we don't always know what the future will look like. If you know what next week looks like, or next month, or next September looks like, talk to our leaders in the land, because they would love to help. This we know from the gospel stories of the cross. 
The disciples and the followers didn't exactly go hunting down the big wigs and the powers that be in the land, the political and the religious leaders offering them a vision of the future. No, no, not at all. In fear, they went underground. They went into hiding as quick as they could, lest maybe they would be next. You see, these were incredibly stressful, fearful times for everyone. And it's not enough to say, oh, it's only Friday, you know, it's only Saturday, Uh, Sunday's coming, wait until Sunday, until the resurrection. Don't worry, life will bounce back to normal. No, it doesn't work that way. A distinguished psychotherapist who counsels people who are going through uh, rough and difficult times once said something about the need to achieve more balance in our lives. He said this, Balance is the illusion that you are actually in control of your life. We human beings are creatures that seek balance and calm and predictability in our lives. Uh, If we can get ourselves to live in that sort of a world, uh, it's easier for us to live our lives. We have balance, or at least we have the illusion that the world is in our hands, and that the direction of our lives is firmly within our grasp, that tomorrow is left up to us. And then comes Sunday, the resurrection. Death and taxes, we hear a lot about that these days. Uh, They're normal. But the resurrection? It's not normal. Jesus done thrown everything out of kilter, said one of the characters in Flannery O'Connor's stories. Jesus done thrown everything out of kilter. The resurrection has turned everything upside down and out of kilter, and yet everything possible, we try to get it back into balance. Isn't it true? Uh, Interestingly, we didn't read from the book of Mark this morning, but uh, interestingly, the book of Mark has an addendum to it that is added years later by the early church. You see, The early, most reliable manuscripts have the book of Mark ending suddenly with this resurrection story. Uh, As it goes, we know the story well. Some women are bringing some spices to the grave. Uh, They arrive, they encounter the rolled away stone, the empty tomb, they encounter an angel of the Lord, and he says to them, chapter 16, verse 6, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. And then, a few verses later, at the end of the chapter, at the end of the book, we get this strange ending. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Well, in many respects, this is a letdown to the book. An abrupt ending to a spectacular story, a spectacular event. Mark tells of no further appearances of the risen Lord, no suppers in Emmaus, no reassuring words on the road to Jerusalem, no breakfast at the beach, none of that. There's only a surprising, stunning, fearful ending. They were honestly terrified. And you would think that Mark would have done a better job at ending his book than on this note. You know, it's not Friday. You know, it's Sunday. This is great news we're talking about. Couldn't he have done a better job? Or is the issue just a matter of giving these women we read about in the passage, giving the early church, giving all of us a little more time to to process events like this? You know, things will calm down, balance will return, even with the resurrection, things will get back to normal, and we'll feel like our lives are firmly in our grasp once again. But the resurrection of Jesus from the dead doesn't work that way at all. Everything about it is not normal. In raising Jesus from the dead, a man who had been put to death by the authorities, by raising this executed, crucified man from the dead, God literally turned the world upside down. You see, Easter upsets the world through a scandalous look at a truth 
a glimpse of a world no longer jerked around by the power of death, and it's much larger than something that simply happened to Jesus. It is something that happens to all of us. It is something so grand and cosmic, and it even has political implications. Yes, political implications. Now, in recent weeks, we've all been talking about the coronavirus, and some of us had conversations here and there, and discussing views on what's best to do. Uh, some of us have said, and I've heard it said a couple times, that we wouldn't want to be a politician at such a time as this. And I would dare say that I wouldn't want to be a political leader or an authority at such a time as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, when we, you read those two passages that we took a look at earlier, Acts 5 and Matthew 27, we see that the political powers in act, are totally in action. And you notice that something is afoot. Trouble is brewing. The security forces are skittish. The world has been shaken. Uh, there has been an unnatural disaster and intrusion. Nobody expected the resurrection of crucified Jesus. And the authorities, hoping to keep public order, call a state of emergency. The troublemakers, those who attempt to capitalize on this disruption, are rounded up, locked up, and brought to court to give an account of themselves. You see, this resurrection commotion must be silenced. You, you can't have all this talk of this new life going on, they said. You know, life after death, spreading like wildfire. You can't have rumors going around about a hoax. You know, we can't upset the public, say the leaders. So when you read that one passage, Matthew 27, you know, the first question that comes to mind when, when you read that is, can you believe this? They're back at it again. You know, can't they give this man, this leader, a break? You see, Pilate just had handed Jesus over to be crucified, even though he knew he was innocent. And now that he's dead in the tomb, they're at the door again. They're at the door again. They're still terrified and fearful. And as you know, I'm talking about the Jewish leaders that we read about in verse 62. This Jesus fellow scared them half to death when he was alive, so they asked Pilate for his help, but it appears that even though he has been crucified, their worst fears are not yet put to rest. If I were Pilate, I would have said, you know what, uh, what do I have to do to keep you guys happy? But to Pilate's credit, he doesn't say that. He doesn't seem to be irritated at all towards these paranoid Jewish leaders when they show up with this strange, strange request to secure the tomb of Jesus as tight as possible, lest the unthinkable happen, that is, his followers steal the body and make it sound like he's alive. So, yes, to his credit, Pilate doesn't laugh at their request or ridicule them. He just gives the order. Secure it as tight as you can, and he seals the tomb with this huge stone in front of it, and they post a guard as an extra precaution. An interesting, uh, maybe typical reaction by the authorities. Well, needless to say, deep down in their hearts, their real fear was that this man who had just been crucified would really come alive again, as he seemed to insinuate when he was alive. That mutilated body there laying in the tomb would start to breathe once again, stand up and move towards them with this unspeakable power that the grandest of all miracles would appear and happen there in the tomb. And the thought of such a miracle scared them half to death. And it showed, because it showed who really was in control and in power. Pilate, we beg you, they said, secure the tomb as tight as you can. Please lock it up. This is all we ask. Could this be at this time that they were asking too much of Pilate? You know, how does one stop the world from turning? How does Pilate and his guards secure the world against a miracle, a power like this? Well, but then maybe securing the world against a miracle is not as hard as one thinks. It's not as hard as one thinks. There's probably a lot 
one can do in defense of a miracle like this. Uh, we do it all the time. Today, we do it all the time. The Jewish leaders weren't thinking through this uh, far enough or deep enough. They thought that if they just secured the tomb as tight as possible, that it would solve the problem. Maybe a better way is not to try and prevent the miracle or the resurrection from happening, like I said. That's like trying to stop the world from turning. A better approach is every time a miracle happens, somehow explain it away. Deflect it. Change the story. You know, alter one's memory in one way or another and dispute the truth. Spin the story any way you want. Claim it to be a hoax. You know, change the narrative. Um, make a defeat sound like a victory. And soon everyone is asking, did it really happen that way? And doing this is a lot easier than securing the world against a grand resurrection, like a grand miracle like the resurrection. I think we look at all the commotion going on here in this passage, and we see it at two levels. The people on the street and the leaders in leadership. And they are almost more fearful after the resurrection than they were before. And none of the gospel stories have Jesus and the angels and those talking after the resurrection saying words like, now, you don't have to worry about dying anymore. We don't hear that language. You don't have to worry about dying anymore. No, what Jesus does say to us as followers, to the church, is that there's work to be done. In effect, he says this, the cross didn't stick. Their plan to stop my movement, my new world I am ushering in, didn't work. It's going to continue. Matter of fact, my plan to love even your enemies, to be willing to sacrifice, to be willing to suffer, to even die for the sake of the love that I'm talking about, has been vindicated this past weekend by the Father. In fact, if you thought the opposition to this kind of a kingdom, this kind of a world where the first shall be last and the greatest among you a servant, those opposed to us in the past now will really be opposed to us. Pilate and the Jewish leaders wanted to silence this before. Now they will be furious. They will be desperate. So go tell them. Tell everyone that I'm risen and that I'm alive and that their plan has failed. So on this Sunday, many years ago, our lives didn't get safer. Our lives got a whole lot more dangerous. What got released there on that Sunday, that Resurrection Sunday, was not comfort. Let's be honest. After the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, things would never be normal again. Amen. Shall we pray? Let's pray. Jesus, you come to us and you proclaim that you are the resurrection and the life. You entered this world of suffering and death and you gave yourself over into the hands of those who hated you and were determined to kill you. Yet in your darkest moments, You fixed your eyes on the joy that was set before you, that after the resurrection, you would possess us as your people forever. You never wavered in your desire to have us as your inheritance or in your faith that the Father would accomplish this through your death and resurrection. Thank you for enduring through deep suffering in order that we may become like you and be with you forever. Lord, come quickly, we pray. Amen. Well, this brings us to the end of our service, our Easter service, and I would like to end by giving a benediction, and then we will have a closing song after that. These are the well-known words from Numbers chapter 6, our closing blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you, and may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Judah, the Lamb who was slain, you ascended to heaven and evermore will reign. At the end of the age, when the earth you reclaim, you will gather the nations before you, and the eyes of all men will be fixed on the Lamb who was crucified. 
King of all kings and 